Johnny Worthen is an award-winning, multi-genre, tie-dye-wearing author, voyager, and damn fine human being. Trained in literary criticism and cultural studies, he earned his ba bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Utah. Beyond English on a good day, he speaks Danish and reads Latin. He is a past Utah Writer of the Year. An avowed deconstructionist, Johnny writes upmarket stories from the inside out, beginning with theme and pursuing an idea through whatever genre will best serve it. So far, he has published fiction novels as mystery, young adult, comedy, urban fantasy, horror, and science fiction, both traditionally and indie. A frequent presenter and panelist at writing conferences and fan conventions, he is active in local communities of artists and writers, a longtime volunteer for the League of Utah Writers, the state's oldest and largest writing organization. And he has served in several high positions of leadership, including president from 2018 to 2020. When not writing his own stuff, Johnny edits professionally for a small dark fiction press in Los Angeles and teaches creative writing at the University of Utah and as associate instructor. He lives in Sandy, Utah with his wife, sons and cats. There's also a lawn. Today we're gonna to talk about the faceted book, which is um, a product of my experience of writing. Um, I like to say that I am, no, I am. I am 11 years into my 10 year plan to be an overnight success. I am the idiot who quit his day job to become a writer. So um, I go to a lot of a lot of presentations, a lot of conferences. I, I love writing community. I, I adore this stuff. Anyway, so um, this particular uh, bit of information came kind of late and it's just a way of looking at what we do. So anyway, okay, first of all, who am I? Why do I get a talk here? Well, besides that awesome, awesome um, bio, which um, I wrote, you got to be able to do this for me. Um, okay, this is something, I, as I said, writer of the year and all that's pretty much all there. Um, and if you take a, and on the right hand side, my published works, uh, the yellow ones are most definitely true mysteries. I consider What a Mortal Hand and Brand Demand also one. And all of my books are basically um, uh, mysteries in some degree, because I think mysteries are at the heart of it. So I have a definite soft spot for mysteries. Um, my best, my first bestseller was Eleanor, a young adult character study with paranormal elements that, that landed well. And uh, at the time I actually, um, when I placed it, I, I sent both, it was a new publisher in Utah and I sent both Eleanor and The Finger Trap, my mystery, uh, to the publisher. They said, we love them both. Which do you want to publish with us? And I said, take them both or neither. That's how arrogant I was at the time. And damn, if they didn't take them both. So um, I got Eleanor and Celeste and David out. They won awards. They had bestseller. It was great. I thought I was a young adult author for a while. Then The Finger Trap came out, and I won the highest award the league could give as a, as a Diamond Quill Best Book of the Year. And then my publisher folded. Damn. Anyway, so we shopped it a while. Then I went indie for a while, and I couldn't let Tony die. So I went indie to bring Tony back alive. So it's, um, in the, and then just this year, just um, January, um, I signed a contract with a Las Vegas publisher, um, Wolfpack. You might've read about them in the Publishers Weekly. They're picking up Tony. They're gonna bring him back to life. And they've even bought the next book, which hasn't even um, been written yet, which is terrifying. But anyway, so anyway, um, as I said, I'm 10 years into my, uh, 11 years into my 10 year plan. And a lot of the stuff, um, it's been hard. I've had to learn it myself. I didn't even know there were writing groups for the first two years of my career. I just knew, knew to write, knew to study, knew to read. But um, then I found out one of the one of the terrible tricks, one of the terrible things about uh, about being a writer, rejection. Oh boy, if there is a job with more rejection, I don't know what it is. I think a telemarketer with Tourette's gets less rejection than a than a professional writer. But that's me. That's me. I don't know about it. Anyway, so and then just and then I just hit what could be the pay dirt, um, the big time with a uh, uh, Kings, Queens, and Colonies. That that little green book there. Um, a new genre, uh, published out of jolly old England, no less, uh, distributed through Simon & Schuster, so um, I'm international. And just, um, uh, see, two days ago, this happened. So, damn, damn, it feels good to be a gangster. 
yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm very happy about that. Okay, so that's who I am. I've been doing this. My, my, my bio said pretty much, it's a good bio. You usually have to buy it myself. So we'll leave it at that. Okay, so <sighs> it has never been easier to be published, but it has never been harder to be read. So how do you stand out? I mean, with, uh, with modern technology, anybody can publish a book, turn it around, and, and have, have it on Amazon in, in an afternoon, which is, which is perfectly, perfectly legitimate. But how do you get anybody to read it? How do you get people interested? I mean, that's, that's one way. I want to be traditional for the most part because um, I'm a lazy man. So I started thinking about what people, why people read. And, you know, looking at reading and books now, I mean, the, every once in a while, somebody will say reading is dead. And it's, um, there is some truth to that. I think the, the heyday of the, of the novel had to be Dickens' time, right? I mean, Dickens, they say, when he was alive and he was writing, he was read by 80% of the English-speaking world. That's huge. That's, that's unimaginable now. Harry Potter and, and Stephen King, the two luminaries we always think of when we think of successful writers today, don't come close to those kind of numbers. Edgar Allan Poe, when he was struggling, I mean, he never made it. But anyway, uh, now he, he's a household word, but nobody reads him. And because we have so much other, you know, our entertainment plate runneth over. We have movies to compete with now. We have music, always have TV. Video games are big. Uh, my wife is a Candy Crush fan and um, breaks my heart, but that's her thing. And not only are we competing with all of these things, all of these very, very easy, easy to consume uh, genres, uh, not genres, uh, medias. But uh, we're also keep competing with other books published this year and last year and next year and ever published. So there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to try to get your words in front of a reader. I mean, if anyone manages to do it successfully, hallelujah, you've, you've succeeded. But there is a place for writing and there's a place for reading. It will never, at least in, as I understand it, it'll never be replaced. Because as Stephen King says, it is a unique type of telepathy is that when you read, it is not a, it is not, it is not passive. You must bring to the table your own knowledge. It, you, you must meet in the middle and you create the scenes in, in your mind. In, in other words, it is an active endeavor and nothing else can do it. It's also the, um, the soul of all the others. All the other medias come from where we are. Anyway, so I'm looking at the reader. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, how, how does a writer compete with all this? What, what can we do? How, how do, how do, how, how do I, how do I, how do I stand out? What do I do? And then I started looking at mysteries particularly because I'm a huge mystery fan. And I bet many of you are here too. Am I right? Come on, that, that's some blatant pandering there. Okay, all right. So, all right, but I looked at, looked at mystery. And as you mentioned, um, Edgar Allan Poe was the start of this. And yet, even, but now it's so popular. It is, though it's a relatively new genre, what, under 150 years, it is still mature because it has been done so much. It is conventional by modern standards and it's very formulated. Pretty much, you know what you're gonna get with a mystery. It's not unlike, it's little different than romance, which has a much tighter formula, but still we have a, we have a formula. We have uh, crime, crime is committed. We solve the crime, it is solved, it's, it's over. Anyway, it's predictable and yet it's still very popular and going strong. I'll, have all the stories been told? That was what I was sort of thinking about. And I went, oh, no, no, why is it still going? And you know, and it's the uh, it's a crowded marketplace, right? I would say that the uh, the biggest lie you'll run into in publishing is all characters in this book are fictional and bear no resemblance to anybody living or dead. Okay, the second the second biggest lie in publishing is I want something new and unique and different. Send me. I, I'm looking for the for the dreamers or, or, or something new and unique. That could be on an agent's website. Lies, absolute lies. They're looking for the same, but different. Every once in a while, somebody will break, break out and do something new, uh, vampires or dystopias or something. Um, but for the most part, it's the same, but different. And mysteries, when, you know, are, are that. We have to be the same, but different. We, we're the same by definition, but how do we be different, you know? Recombinations, subgenres, 
gimmicks, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, I have a picture of a monk out there and those of us, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the choir here, but everybody, everybody who knows Monk knows he's Hercule Poirot version 2.0, and yet there's still a place for him. You modernize him. Sherlock Holmes is still being made into very bad television and worse movies. But okay, sorry, I, I digress. So anyway, let's take a look at the marketplace. So these are these are some recent. It's the industry does is not does not easily give up their financial secrets. They are guarded by a three headed dog and a mirror that you got to. All right, sorry, that's that's one genre. But they're guarded. But I dug this stuff out. Okay, so in twenty fourteen to twenty fifteen. And, you know, this is the last, honestly, these were the last numbers I could find hard numbers for, um, besides the next thing. Okay, so you see adult nonfiction goes from uh, 200 and, uh, what's that, 250, 240 million to 256 million, an increase. Adult fiction is a fraction of that, a fraction. It went up, which is nice, because people, believe it or not, are still reading. Juvenile nonfiction went way up. Uh, nonfiction went way up and juvenile fiction kind of pulled back a bit. The Harry Potter was over. We've already, we already know who won the Hunger Games and the Maze Runner just wasn't doing it for anybody. But nevertheless, notice these numbers. Notice that together, um, adult fiction and um, uh, the adult fiction versus the nonfiction and the, and the juvenile nonfiction versus juvenile fiction, i.e. that is quid pro quo. What I'm trying to tell you, here's a word on the street. Nonfiction outsells fiction. That's interesting, right? Of course, you know, that's not exactly going to help us, but you know, this is something more recent. This is, uh, this is from the le letter review, and I have a link here. By the way, if anybody wants a copy of these slides, they can email me. It'll be at the end of the presentation, and I'll send them to you if you find these useful. I want to read them again, share them with your friends, put them in a scrapbook, you know, maybe, you know, a little reading at, at night. I don't know what to say. Anyway, experts suggest that the global fiction books market will grow from a 10 billion in 2021 to 10.46 billion in 2022. The nonfiction book market is set to grow from 13.2 to 14.02. Thus, as a market, nonfiction outperforms fiction, and the trend will continue in the future as it has in the past. So, okay, that makes sense, I guess. A lot of illiterate people don't want to be bothered with, with reading fiction. However, you can see there's an attraction there. I mean, I read nonfiction and fiction. I'm sure we all do. But that's the key. This is why I started looking into it. Looking into these numbers, I started recognizing the idea of the fictional facet. Okay. So, sleuths, why do people read books? Here's your clues. Oh, all right. Here's the solution. I, uh, it's really easy. I figured it's late at night. You all want to just get the short form. Okay. English class, entertainment, and education. I get the three E's. I want to keep it really egalitarian. So, okay, there's English class, right? People have to read in school. At least they did when I was in school. God help us if they're not anymore. But this is one of the reasons why, why juvenile fiction is so popular. It's because um, their children, young adults, are made to read. And so they learn to read and they do read and they read outside and they haven't it becomes a habit with them it's it's fantastic it's taught to them because it's you know they need to teach them language skills reasoning skills everything that the language can bring um that makes them a better person is taught through reading an english class and it's and for one thing it's required or penalties kids have to read or they don't pass their classes and then they they're kicked out of the house and, and they live under a bridge and do unspeakable things for cigarettes. It's terrible. Um, boy, uh, if the jokes don't land, just just wave your hand or something. <laughs> Stop it, you're killing me. All right, sorry. So anyway, but that's important. But notice educational is very much there. And of course, everybody at some point, if they still continue reading for pleasure, it's for entertainment. And what do we read? We read a well-paced story that's seductive and a compelling story. That goes without saying. Sympathetic, interesting characters and escape. Okay, yeah, all those things are there. That's why we read it for entertainment, right? But there's more to that. 
All right, the last one is education. Reinf okay, we also read for education. Do not underestimate this. We learn or we know that um, what makes us a, a culture, a species unlike any other is our ability to trans to, to store language outside of ourselves across time. And that is why the educational aspect of reading is fantastic. And that's what we trigger, right? First of all, we read often, you know, and that this is probably not a great idea, but we often read just to just for reinforcement to to show us that we're right. You know, that's a, <coughs> there's a lot of talk about that, about how the Internet is now dividing us up and only giving us feeding us information that confirms our our, our feelings. But that's still something we do even with books. It's, it'll, we'll get a wider aspect of it, but also we do it to learn new things it's because it's exotic and it's interesting. And it's, it's a safe novelty to get in there, right? I remember I had a, um, remember James Bond is a good example. Before, I, I, I should, it's the same way, but I remember when I was first learn, getting into James Bond movies before the, um, the books, we can talk about the books. We're not going to, we'll talk about the movies because everybody's seen the movies and maybe three of you have read the books and they're kind of iffy. But anyway, one of the things that made James Bond so cool is he was always in these weird ass places. We've never been to Morocco. We've never been to a glacier or underwater fighting people. You know, that's exotic. We've never been, suddenly we're in Jamaica. We're, a, we're having a party. That kind of thing sold the movies as much as anything, right? Anyway, education. Okay, so, but okay, so, the big question: What could make your book stand out? Knowing these things, knowing why people read, and knowing you have a ripping good story, but you just got to how you got to stand stand it out. Well, it's not. It's now time to examine the multifaceted novel. Huh? 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 I should put a little trademark there, restricted me. Anyway, because a good story is no longer enough. As a matter of fact, horrible as this sounds, in my experience, I have found that a wonderfully good, well-written story can work against you. If you're literate and you write for utter, utter, if you're literate and you write for other literate people, you have limited your market share immensely. I mean, people ask me, Johnny, how, who was it, they might say, Johnny, who was it that um, inspired you to become a writer? And I will look them in the eye and I will say Dan Brown and Stephanie Meyer, because if that shit can make bestseller, I can, right? You got to think that way. Because they didn't win their fame by good writing. They, they were adequate. Dan Brown, nearly adequate. But they got the facets because conceive of a book with elements that address multiple reasons why people read, new information being key. Think of it as a complex buffet, buffet of flavors, value-added dimensions, and details that set it apart. Think of any book that's made any kind of waves, and you will see not just a well-written story with excellent language, but concepts and ideas and places and settings. And we'll take a look at, and, and, and just knowing this is not enough. We have to actually see how we can focus this in our, in our creation of a novel, of a book, in order to maximize our potential to get noticed. A good story is not enough. You need the sparkly facets. Okay, so let's take a look first. Eyes, new eyes on old parts, right? There's the theme you're gonna work with, your plot, your character, setting, style, author, we'll look at extras. <laughs> These are some of the key, um, key facets. Okay, so theme. I'm a lover of theme. C Craig mentioned that, um, that this, I write books from the inside out. This is me. This is deconstructionist. This is not for everybody, but I like to lead with it so it's out of the way. I like to say, I get an idea and then I go with it. And um, sometimes the ideas can, can lead the other things. But um, as a writer, um, you're a witness, you, you, you are recording culture, you are building culture, you are building society. So the things you imagine today could well be true later. I mean, we have to look no further than the Star Trek uh, communicator, tricorder, warp drive, alien ears, anyway. Um, but anyway, but make your book about something, 
was one of the best pieces of advice a publisher gave me early in my career. Sure, you want to write a great story about happy little elves slaying orcs as if they don't have families of their own. That'll be wonderful. But if your book isn't about something, why bother? You know, so ultimately you should be, there should be something. You know, sometimes the themes just kind of play themselves out. Good versus evil, love conquers all, resistance is futile, that kind of thing. But have it. If you can think of what it is, hold it. An examination of this idea. Because this is the thing that English, you know, English classes look for. I mean, I'll tell you the line I use at Comic-Con to sell my books. <clears throat> it hasn't worked yet. <clears throat> All of my books can be taught effectively in an English class. <clears throat> yeah, okay. I'm working on it. I got a better one. It's about pirates. Ha! Rapey people are fights and nails. Okay. But anyway, but think about it. Think about an idea. What is there? What is your book about? Could you, you know, when you ask me what my book is about, I will probably won't even, I can start telling you about the love and and dishonor, and you won't, won't even know I'm talking about a, meta, a, a, a metaphysical horror until later into it because I'm so thematically oriented. But first of all, keep an idea of a theme. That's that's first. Okay, so we are plot. Well, obviously, you need a well-crafted story, and this, as mystery writers, I hope you understand the absolute necessity of playing fair. Yeah, this is something. This is one of my peeves. Um, Fair play, as you know, is when the reader uh, has a chance to solve the mystery along with the detective. No information is kept. The detective has no information. The reader doesn't have. The reader has no information. The detective doesn't have. Um, and the mystery unfolds. And at the end of it, when it's revealed, it is a inevitable surprise how it all fit together. It's wonderful. It's satisfying. That to me is one of the one of the hallmarks of a good mystery. I know mystery writers who just write by the seat of their pants. You know those pantsers. I don't know who did it yet. They'll say, but maybe in a couple of chapters I'll have an idea. Damn those people! Damn them to hell! Unless there are any in the room, then you're wonderful people. God bless you. Have you lost weight? You look wonderful. Seriously, jeez, you look great. Um, but seriously, um, I always look at Broadchurch. Anybody seen that? Any big David Tennant fans seen Broadchurch? Okay, well, it's worth your time, if only because it's it's like Twin Peaks. Every single episode is compelling with clues and ideas and motives and everything. And when the final reveal happens, it could have been anybody. There's no way to pick it out. It's just they, somebody pulled a name out of the hat and says, okay, it's Larry. Larry did it. Unfulfilling, unfulfilling. But that's where a well-crafted story really, really matters. Because one of the things you do is you, um, as mystery writers, you are, um, you're doing a literary Sudoku here. You're planning a puzzle. And one of the things people come to reading, uh, to read a mystery for is that puzzle, is, 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 the, is the thrill, the, the chase, the, the figuring it all out. I know many of you probably do plot. If you don't know who committed your murder when you start writing, you're not ready to write yet, in my opinion. But anyway, but okay, so you have well-crafted stories. Maybe you can write a romance, same idea. Um, you need, to, you know, your good writing counts. This is well where we, we always work on adjectives, all the other stuff. Um, all the different levels of your mystery, the, the what happened, how the habits discovered, all that should have, you should have some idea, at least the first story, which means who killed whom and why. And then the detective comes on and tries to figure out that story. The first one you should have. But also consider also subplots. Now, subplots are a wonderful thing to flesh out a novel. They are just wonderful. You probably won't have a lot of room for these in flash fiction or haiku, but in novels you do. In novels you do. You want to have some subplots because it gives you a chance to control the pacing, to get new eyes on the same situation, to get new angles on characters or situations, to expand your theme. All of these are wonderful. That's why I say uh, a parallel plot could be a thematic element, right? Somebody's having a problem with his wife because she's uh, unfaithful. Turns out that being unfaithful was part of the murder that he's investigating. Oh, somebody else is, is, is investigating a... Um, a strange disappearance of a cat and this lady's cat just happened to be disappeared and finds out that she's having kittens i don't know it could 
that, that's not a great example, but it's important. Now take a look at an Indigo Montoya. The only thing cooler than Indigo Montoya would probably be if you wrap that story up with Shakespeare and he made a wedding out of it. That would be the only way you can improve the subplots of A Princess Bride. But that is a great subplot, isn't it? My name is Antigua Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. I mean, come on. We can all quote it. I mean, bonus points if you think you can say to the pain. If you can say the whole spiel, right? Wonderful stuff. Anyway, and then Tatiana comes to all bullshit. But anyway, you want these secondary plots. Make them worthwhile because they're often more interesting than the main plot. We'll get into that. Here's a big one. This is probably the, one of the most important things any mystery writer need, needs to understand because although chances are your, your antagonist will be the most interesting character in your book, who did it, the villain, right? Because the villain, even when they're not on the page, we're always thinking about the villain. Why did they do it? How did they do it? Why did they do it? You know, ooh, could it have been the butler? Anyway, but the protagonist is still the, the avatar. The protagonist is where the readers will enter your story, even if it's uh, an observed um, protagonist like Sherlock Holmes and the story is being told by Watson. You want a very good, interesting main protagonist. So how do you do this? Well, you flesh them out with detail. Okay, strengths and flaws are a big one. Now, Hercule Poirot or Monk later strengths and flaws now i think agatha christie is on record saying when she designed and yes i use the word designed rather than say wrote when she designed hercule poirot the belgian i see you thinking he's french no 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 she deliberately found the opposite of sherlock holmes knowing where we came from he is short holmes was tall he does not fight holmes knew at least how to hold himself. Holmes could handle any society. Poirot was fastidious. He was, he was a pain. He would send his eggs back if they were different sizes. That's the kind of thing. But he had great strength. He was very perceptive. He used psychology as well as deduction. And many of his stories are even fair play, but not all of them. Damn you, damn you, Agatha. You broke my heart. You shouldn't have done it. I'm, I, I'll get over it. Okay. But anyway, that's an important character. The, after, after a while, particularly if you write um, a series, right? The main character you want to come back and visit. We have an example I have here, uh, Harlan um, Coben's Myron Bolitar. I don't know if any of you have read these wonderful, they're old, but I love old writers. And the, his sleuth, if you would call his sleuth, is a sports agent. That's interesting. Later becomes a, an agent agent with literary agents. You know, that's you know, anyway, that's interesting. But that adds something. Lovejoy, if you remember Lovejoy, I know I'm dating myself with these things, but Lovejoy with Ian McShane, who's not to love a little Ian McShane. This is before um, Sheila. And no, it's after Sheila, but before John Wick. He was a sleuth who ran a antiques store. Now we have cooking cozies. Oh, I solve crime in between crumpets. You know, fine, all right. But that's important. Give your characters something different, a background, internal life, something complex. And if you understand it so much, the better. And I put the last temptation of Christ up because um, there was an actual, um, there was a very, con there was a controversial move that was made in that, first of all, you know, for, for whatever reason. But one of the things that the, the critics didn't really latch on to until later was the very bold move that Scorsese made Christ the carpenter, Christ the cross maker. The Romans needed somebody to make crosses who, like a carpenter. So he, early on in the movie, was seen making a cross and he knows this is a sin and he does it anyway. So it's part of getting to know the character. It's a major idea, but to give him that little detail takes to put the whole book, the whole book, the whole story into a new light. Very interesting. Um, in my own in my own examples, for example, I have um, Eleanor, the character has a group, her background is the story, finding out where she came from, her, her superpowers, you know, you can get away with that. But also, uh, my, but then we look at the finger trap, my sleuth, is a comedian, uh, a frustrated stand-up comic, um, who's uh, basically never grown up. And this was pretty easy. I just kind of channeled 
me, but, it was a, but it's a fun series. But that actually makes it worthwhile. So I, I take my superpower, because one of my superpowers in life is I'm memorable. I can be, if, if only for the guy being dragged away because he's done something obnoxious. But that's important. Have an interesting character. Have, have that. Spend a lot of time on your sleuth. Make, find something. He's a bird watcher. Um, he is a... Um, um, she, she is a dancer, an exotic dancer, uh, she, a, a sex worker who's not ashamed of it. All of these things. I mean, they're um, a, a sleuth in, uh, I, I think a, a sleuth in, a, uh, in an FLDS polygamy compound would be instant sell. I swear to God, it would be an instant sell because you have the trappings, the, the trappings of an excellent mystery idea, the murder and mayhem, but you also, but by the reader who gets in there can also explore this very weird cult. I'm waiting for this book to be written. One of my students started it. I pray she finishes it. Otherwise, hey, it's up to you. It's, it's up for grabs. It's yours. Okay, so, all right, main character. Then look at other characters. All right, so. You have supporting characters. You might have multiple mains, right? Which is which is kind of popular. I like multiple mains. You can do that better in some stories than in others. Um, in um, yeah, okay. Well, I'll look at uh, Six of Crows. I don't know if you know this book. Um, Six of Crows is a young adult. It takes a, a six young adults, thieves in a in a steampunk setting, commit crimes. And they're all interesting. Um, you know, they're as you expect. But consider also when you make your uh, supporting characters too good, too well. I always look now, consider, for example, Jar Jar Binks versus Groot. One of those is lovely and charming. And we would, we would, we would, inv we would invite one of them to meet our mothers. The other, we would not hit the brakes if you saw them jaywalking. You know what I mean? Sorry. Push too hard, Lucas. You let us down again. But that's interesting. They really tried to make this as a takeoff character, which is sad, so you can't push it. And then I like to look at the Pink Panther. I don't know if you know the story about this, but the original Pink Panther, when it was made, and it's a nice sleuth, it's a nice detective story, it was meant to be a David Niven vehicle to shoot him into stardom. Then they cast Peter Sellers. And... The rest is history. The, uh, the rumor I've heard is that um, uh, Niven would never would not speak to Peter Sellers for the rest of his life because of how he stole the movie. But, uh, you know, we got, what, five Pink Panthers out of that? It's still happening. So interesting. But that's the kind of character you want to come back for. That's the kind of character. Niven, uh, was a, his character was, a, I don't know, a five, maybe. But Clouseau, that was a 10. That's, that's archetypical. Okay. So that's an idea. Spend some time on your characters, find out, give, give them hobbies, beekeeping, something, anything that you can bring in to add layers and facets to your story. I will read, a, I, will, uh, I have a choice of reading a mystery about that's a hard boiled cop out of New York solving a crime. Okay. Or a mystery of a, um, a, um, a hitchhiker who reads Shakespeare. And, and uh, it, it is a savant in numbers and uh, has a tattoo she can't remember getting. That's more interesting. Anyway, just saying. Okay, setting facets. This is a big one. Um, often, uh, I, th I think uh, it's too easy to ignore the settings in, in, all, situ in, in all situations, uh, be it a, a scene or the novel itself. But settings have been a huge play in, um, in making books stand out. But um, not as much now, as possibly, as they used to be when people didn't travel. I honestly think that Jules Verne's entire career was based on the idea that, no, that tourism hadn't been invented yet. If you read his books, they're fantasy travel logs. I mean, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is 200 pages of sponges and a paragraph of a squid. Whatever. Anyway, sorry. Okay, I digress. All right. Um, okay, so remember educational entertainment thematic consideration. So location, real or imaginary, right? Where are you putting it? Um, Six of Crows takes place in that very popular steampunk world. They're, all the characters in there are, are edgy, they're minorities, they're, they're, they're pansexuals, they're, they're uh, 
Uh, they, they come from all different ranks of life. They're a poker. Basically, it's a scattergun of, of character types. But that's but their but their setting is important in this fantasy setting. Game of Thrones important. It's important to have Game of Thrones in a fantasy setting because dragons in Phoenix in 2022 or 2023 now is not out of the question. Not with after what we've been through, but it's still unlikely. Okay, so um, think also of okay, think of uh, Tony Hillerman's Skinwalkers and his um, Lee Poor novels. Would they have? been half as famous or popular or exciting to read if they weren't on a Navajo reservation? Oh, and if those of you thinking the words uh, cultural appropriation, go wash your mouth out with soap. We're writers. This is what we do. We imagine, we empathize, we share, we create. Get that out of your mouth. Anyway, so, okay, that's important. Um, in my book, Kings, Queens, and Colonies, I had to create an entire universe, do the world building that everybody's been talking about my entire life. I've never thought I'd have to do it. I needed it. I did it. The setting is, 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 is an important consideration for the book. One of the reasons people read it is because it is in this futuristic steampunk past. It's got a good element of the past, the, um, Elizabethan England, and the future far out in the distance. Very important. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Need I say more? The Great Gatsby, for example, um, which as you may or may not know, was not a very successful book when it was published. But in retrospect, it became the definitive book of the Golden Age. Was it the Golden Age? What's it called? Is it? The... I think it was the Golden Age. Anyway, the 20s when, um, when the flappers were out and everybody drank champagne out of each other's shoes and everybody got chlamydia and it was prohibition. Um, anyway, but also To Kill a Mockingbird is another example. It's setting in the deep south, go to carry along with its theme and its characters, all of it together. But again, one of the things those two books have is they become um, icons, if you will, of their respective times. You can write historical as well. Think of CAD file, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Name of the Rose. Unreadable book, but still interest. Okay, society of what's your setting? It can be its own art. Um, then there's, for example, then there's styles, style art, style facets, which are more gimmicks than anything. But we'll talk about them. Um, there's a cross genre effort uh, elements. First of all, a comedy, horror, drama, romance, fantasy, etc. Cross. I mean, genre is such a slippery concept. Anyway, remember the the best and the only definition of genre worth remembering is it is the sh it is the name of the shelf upon which the bookstore will put your book to try to sell it. It is a marketing thing, but for the most part, anyway. But being able to jump around and have multiple things. Um, uh, for example, um, the, the very popular Wednesday on Netflix right now, we have young adults, comedy, horror, and mystery all wrapped up. Oh, and music video. Might as well do that, right? Why not? Okay. Um, that's important. Th think about the facets you can have. For example, um, I have a picture of 13 Reasons Why up here, which I find um, a rather controversial book. Um, but one of the things, one of the style, style choices that Asher made in this book was the, um, it's an epistolary novel where each chapter is actually the transcription of, 30, of, of tapes that the suicided girl left behind. That was an interesting choice. One of, and here's Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard has this very, very unique style, which, which, made, which I think people would read just, just for the style. And that is that of the invisible author. Bones turned a page, read down the entries and stopped. You got to miss, guys, six weeks over. He died, Chili said. How do you know he died? He tell you. That kind of sharp dialogue and in your face crime Second to none, Elmer Leonard's the master. And then there's Cormac McCarthy. You know this author is with you. He is, he's, 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 he's the voice of God. There is no God, and we are his prophets. That, that's, that's the kind of prose you're going to run into in Cormac McCarthy. By the way, I'm reading The Passenger now. I cannot recommend it higher, though I still don't know what it's about. Okay, um, voice, point of view, the description, how are we going to do all that? Okay, so... But actually, what I find off, what I find sells better than even either uh, than fat, that is the author facet. Now, this you don't have a lot to do with this, 
you kind of you, you, you've already taken the birth lottery. This is where you landed. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. But anyway, take a look at some of these books that hit bestseller or that became very popular and understand that the reason that they were catapulted might not necessarily be great writing, but it's who the authors were, what not just the stories. Ulysses S. Grant, mem the Civil War memoirs of said Ulysses S. Grant, famously published by Mark Twain, another author who struggled and yet succeeded in earning a living in the old days. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas has Hunter S. Thompson's style all the way through it. It's Hunter's gonzo approach. Aragon, do you remember Aragon when it came out? Big deal, big deal. Like a 13 year old wrote it. It was everything was, oh wow, a 13 year old wrote this, right? That really pushed it up. I mean, there's a lot more happening that we didn't see, but that was the push. Is this complete? interesting novel was written by a child and it's 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 amazing i did it by um <clears throat> that's the oj oj did that so yeah yeah so that's illegal to uh, make money on a crime if you commit it but since he was acquitted hey what are you gonna do all right all right so but then the, okay uh, other facets to look for so um the author facet is huge um, before we move too far on this, um, I do want to take a moment to talk about uh, current trends that I have observed in the marketplace. And you, maybe you have read this, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm off, but there is a large agents that, that I'm querying now are now listing specifically that they're looking for uh, people of color, um, LGBTQ authors, uh, own voices. There's a large push right now to, to hear from those voices. So um, that is a facet that at this point can really pay off. So for what it's worth, I mean, uh, uh, as, as, a, as a white cis guy, looks like a thumb, bald, tie dye's cool, I know, but they'll get me there. But that's not important. But that is something right now that is very, very fashionable. So if that's on your side, excellent. Otherwise, you can be an expert in this. I, I'm a, I am an expert on fishing. So at that, okay. So we're now look at the nostalgia facet, which I was, which I didn't think was a big deal till it appeared everywhere. This is a fun one. Um, Ready Player One. I like this book, um, but it's it's basically pandering to my generation. It's Dungeons and Dragons and and video games I grew up in. It's Pac Man and Asteroids, right? It's it's a trip down memory lane as is the perks of being Wallflower. And frankly, Stephen King, it, as is um, Stand By Me, is all about nostalgia. It really is. You read these books, um, and uh, if you were alive in those days, you know, you, it really is pandering to you. The nostalgia facet cannot be underestimated. Okay, um, lifestyle elements. This is, this is uh, the, the continuation of what I mentioned, but many publishers are looking for now. Uh, they both died in the they both die in the end. It was an award winning book, bestseller. But I can't help think, and it's a good story. It had a couple of interesting facets, not the least of which was the two young adult protagonists who were gay. But also, it has a good science fiction element about at what, about you were warned about what day you're going to die. So it had the good science fiction element. It had the gay element. It had New York going for it. All those things. I mean, come on. If you're going to send this to a New York editor today. You could do worse than have those facets. The Hate You Give, a timely piece, also excellent written. And it um, was not her, and its, it's subject matter was very timely. Um, you know, uh, being a black inner city uh, during police, police, uh, what's the word, murder of other people, important. Um, also, um, other lifestyles would be The Maid. I don't know if you read The Maid by Nita Prose, but it's uh, The Maid, um, it's kind of like the Rosie syndrome. The Maid is a, it's a, it's a mystery novel. Um, the Maid has Asperger's, and that's one of the elements of that story that really help, that really uh, set it aside, or set it apart from, uh, from other books. Is you, you get a, a glance into that particular lifestyle, what it is to have that particular um, condition. All right, educational elements. I love these. Now, um, by the way, if you know who James Clavell is, you've just dated yourself. The biggest name when I was growing up, everybody had a book about 10,000 pages deep. They were reading it on the beach. He was, he was the man. Him, him and um, um, 
uh, who did Centennial. Anyway, anyway, but anyway, at the time, so he wrote a book called Shogun. <laughs> And um, it was, and it, the whole book took place in medieval Japan with the rise of the Portuguese. Wonderful book, made a great mini series, very exciting. You learned a lot about Japan that you wouldn't have otherwise. That was Clavel's big deal. He had an army of researchers working for him, and his books were just filled with these very interesting things. So there'd be a story there somewhere, but also you'd be in these places at these times, seeing these things that you wouldn't have otherwise. Wonderful. Umberto Eco, like I mentioned, the aforementioned unreadable, best-selling book, The Name of the Rose, where you got to know what it's like to be a Franciscan monk during the Dark Ages, which I wouldn't have known otherwise. Apparently, uh, you, um, uh, you, were, you were Scottish and um, uh, young girls threw themselves at you. Anyway, I don't know. Dick Francis' famous uh, uh, stories that took place in the um, uh, horse racing circuit, The Martian by Andy Weir. Martian is a fun story because he started out indie doing this. And as a, if you don't know the story, he posted it online and had scientists check his work as he went. So except for the one uh, MacGuffin, the, 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 the inciting incident where the dust storm blew everything down, all of it is just right on factual and scientifically checked, did not hurt. Um, and then is the new cooking cozies that we've seen too many of. So you read a nice mystery, not a lot of death, but you get a recipe out of it. After somebody's dead, you want to make some brownies. Here's a recipe. That sells. It's another element. It's another facet. Okay. Cross genre. Hit or miss on these, okay? Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. I know. I was surprised too that this even exists, but it does. It's sold. Christopher Moore's Lamb, if you don't know, it's a comedy gospel, according to Biff. I've read this. Uh, my humor is a little different, but that's also one Bissler. So crossing genres very dramatically in that case has done very well. Okay. Now, so what we have, okay, so the sales hook. So um, kind, of, kind, of, kind of, here's your kind of checklist. Interesting elements, situational, you know, uh, for example, uh, a, a locked room mystery would be a good situation in this room. That would be one element you can point to. These are things you want to mention in your query letter, for example. A unique subsetting. It takes place on a. It was a. It was a. It was a, it was a sealed room in a space capsule. Ah, ah. Diversity is a very big deal right now. Social significance, I think, is always a nice thing. Class, social, urban fantasy, those kind of things. Add some, add some occupation and hobbies that play into it. This is one of the reasons why cooking cozies work so well, is everyone can identify with a cook, right? Um, unique elements, the fantastic. And gimmicks are not necessarily a bad thing. They really aren't. They, they can get you there. They, they, you, know, you might eventually get sick of it, but it'll be more interesting reading than not having them, you know? But of course, too much can be a bad thing. Warning, 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 warning. Um, I, uh, you know, when I look at what sometimes too much works, look at Columbo, right? The most successful uh, police procedural ever on American television. Let's see. <clears throat> Short, one-eyed, uh, ratty, ratty raincoat, a blue suit that was, I mean, a blue suit that was dyed brown, cigar, a falling down car, wife we never see or name or here, a dog. They threw more gimmicks at this guy than you can swing a cat at. Plus, his style was a gimmick. Oh, my God. And yet, you know, it worked. Now, you know, maybe too, maybe too much is fine. All right. Um, but it could, um, if you can remember that when good writing should always do multiple things at once, right? Any chapter or paragraph should always talk about the plot, but it also displays character, reflects setting, um, works, uh, builds upon theme. All that happens simultaneously. The same thing should happen in your book. You can learn things. So your book should be more about, can, can be more about more than one things as your writing does more things. It's just layering and always, and good writing always works, but it honestly isn't enough anymore. It really isn't. Fads and fashion. Now I know people, and you do too, because you're, you're in the business, who make a living doing this and they produce a book a month. You know who I'm talking about? Aaron's not here. We can talk about him. It's okay. Um, 
but he's doing it, right? Um, that you can do that. You can chase the market. If you're fast enough in the current market, in the current climate, if you have the resources up, you can actually chase the market. Oh, suddenly this book's gone bestseller. I will quickly write, uh, see, um, I forgot, I don't know what's bestselling right now, but you can quickly follow and write a book in the same genre with, the, with similar ideas and you can get it done. But I don't recommend that unless you can do it. Um, I think, I think imitating, imitating your, your favorite authors is, is, is fine. Uh, that's pastiche. And the, the always lines about uh, write what you know is, is always true, but know a lot. So do your research, right? Um, yeah, and there's good writing again. Okay, so move, we're going fast now. We're about done. All right, so you got to get interesting. It's got to be more. A complex, well-conceived character is better than a flat one every single time. A good story placed in a compelling setting with interesting side plots is better than just a good story. A book that resonates on multiple levels is a better book, is better than a book that resonates on just one. Okay, that's it. You got to have as much as you can. You got to have a rhinoceros with a rainbow umbrella and never explain it. No. Okay. Now a caveat. Let's take a look at these two. If you're familiar with these movies, I love them both. One of them was actually successful. The other was a, was a bomb. Um, a lot of it has to do with expectations. So, um, okay, Cabin in the Woods. This was a successful one. It, um, it came, it, it, one of the reasons why it was successful is they didn't make a huge publicity push with it, making promises that people wouldn't understand. Is Cabin in the Woods a horror, a science fiction, a comedy? Is it, um, how would you put it, how would you place it? It's all these things and more. It is a very, very cross-genre piece. Word of mouth got out. It was successful. Sucker punch. A psychological steampunk pre-John Wick kind of fighting thing. Very, very unusual. Um, takes place in a mental ward. None of it's real. It's it's all fantasy. And but it was it was it was it was sold as if it's what you see is what you get. It's it's the future and big robots are attacking you and this group of plucky girls will stop it. That wasn't the story at all. It's about a, a girl struggling with the with with the death of a loved one, and these are the creations of her of her of her distraught mind. It was hated, bombed. Hated. So anyway, be careful about promising things and not delivering. If your book looks like it's going to be A, but it's B, you're going to piss readers off and it's hard to get them back. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, I recommend you watch it though. Watch both of these. Okay. So anyway, we'll end up with some famous facets that I, I just wondered. Some of, the, some of the books that changed my life I listed here. Uh, Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Some of the facets on that is some of the best prose I've ever read in English. I mean, it's not even English. Um, but also you have the uh, um, Czechoslovakian uh, wars happening. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises. This is one of his early successes. It has the running of the bulls. That's what set that apart at the time. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is a retelling. I mean, can, it wasn't the first wizarding school. I, I believe Ursula K. Le Guin took us to one in Earthsea. But there were the right, um, it was contemporary, it was English, you could recognize the places. Good writing, good enough. The Contender, one of the first books I read with an African-American um, protagonist, boxer, really good. Beloved, another fantastic book with great style, takes place at the end of slavery. Had all of it, had great, great character, all the characters were, were dynamic, beautifully written. The place was fantastic, all of it was good. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. You get a road trip out of that. Ah! Not to mention, it. you get you get you get you, you, you get craziness. Anyway, Hyperion. If I haven't read Hyperion, it's one of my favorite science fictions. Um, it's a retelling of the uh, um, the Canterbury Tales. If you know, if you need to know that, and they're kind of amazing. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, I thought it was just a great story, but it's a retelling. So retellings work, believe it or not. And most recently, I noticed that Where the Crawdads Sing has made, made some um, headway, even got a movie. I read that, and um, that's all about being in the swamp.
still has compelling characters. But trust me, putting it in the swamp did not hurt the story. Swamp is a character. Okay. All right. So what I want you, so, so when you're conceiving your story, load it up with interesting parts, <laughs> if I will. Give it more facets. Give, 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 it, give it a character facet, a setting facet, the plot setting, a, su a, sub, a subplot facet. The more you can get in there, you can shine the light and you have a better chance of getting someone's attention and, and tickling the fancy. That's what it is. That's kind of, kind of um, what you do. And in a crowded marketplace, it goes a long, long way. It really does. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So that's it. Stay connected. You can join my mailing list and get a copy of the Knickknack Keys for free. It's the greatest book you'll ever have read that afternoon. Swear to God. Uh, comedy. Um, email me at johnnyworthen.com if you want a copy of these slides. I will send them to you. And you can read them and share them. And if they made any sense to you, I hope so. Um, uh, let's see, end of my slides. My books, my mysteries. I love my mysteries. Um, Herman to Bighorn County takes place in, Wy in Wyoming. In the wake of Captain Lord on a cruise ship. Um, the counterfeit connection. Well, it's about counterfeits. And it takes place in Park City. If that's not a counterfeit place, I don't know what is. Thicker than water. Deals with family in Moab, which is, um, it's like, it's hot, you know, more of it. And the finger trap, which is the opening. All of these books deliberate setting facets and deliberate settings and deliberate themes to carry the whole story through. That's how I've, I've written this. And of course, um, my science fiction series, which is, I'm just aghast that this exists. I love these. These are selling. I hit bestseller. Get, get a book book. Anyway, anyway so that's um, kind of what I have. Um, I will um, um, stop the share now. And I will take the one question that uh, Lori had, and that is 17. Thanks for asking. Okay. So uh, anyway, that's what I've discovered. And that you really have, and it helps a lot to break out. I talked to agents and everything. What are they looking for? One agent told me that uh, she, what she wanted most right now, this week, was a young adult thriller. And she wasn't going to pick up any, she wasn't even going to look at anything else. So you take your chance. But I bet I could get my mystery, call it a thriller, tell her about how this other character was younger when they were young. I don't know. But it's, it's better. You have a better chance of getting readers if there's more to hang on to. That's kind of what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah, that's the, I know it sounds very elementary, very basic. But if you put your mind to it, you really think about it, you add these things intentionally, not on accident, you can actually make them pay off. I mean, I, as mystery writers, think about who your sleuth is. Are they successful? Are you, are you in love with them? Would a better sleuth, would another sleuth be more interesting? Think of Miss Marple, her superpower, eavesdropping. Wow, who thought of that? Jeez, that's great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, uh, let's see, who, who's, who's the author that did the, the wizard? He, anyway, uh, you know, anyway, lots, lots you can do, but, but you've got to do something. You really got to do something. Uh, new angles. I, um, I know authors that um, lean into other genres, even push it into, you know, how much blood do you put in there? Do you pull it back? Do you have sex and violence? Do you have all these things? So those actually are your friends. Those are your friends. Those are different. Anyway. Okay. So um, any question? Out of curiosity, if I may ask, what facets have you already put into your story that are unusual and have and will set you apart? Are you talking to me, Johnny? Since you answered, you know I am. Oh. Roger, what have you done? <laughs> All right. Uh, when when I first launched my series, it was among very few canine novels out there uh, starring a dog character. In fact, when I wrote that book, there was only one that I knew of. But since then, 
lots have launched. And then the other thing that I did that my publisher said no one else was doing was I had a veterinarian as a protagonist. Excellent. That, that wins. That wins. That's great. Excellent. I like that. Yeah, perfect. Okay. If nonfiction outsells fiction and location is another hook, uh, would a fast fact-based historical thriller be a good choice? And please tell me yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, true. I mean, just look at Truman Capote's in Cold Blood. Nothing's compared to that. That that is that is a classic now. Those kind of stories are great. Whoever's whoever writes a really good uh Valo story is going is going to get a true crime sells. That really does. Use your fictional powers to 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 spice up that industry. I mean, think of all the terrible shit you can write about right now. I mean, uh, I'm in Utah. We we get them. We get them. You know, uh, have you guys had any cults lately? <laughs> you need any? <laughs> Get them over. We kind of push a couple to Idaho. They're making news anyway. Um, yeah, but I, I think that's outstanding. I mean, I mean, I. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, how, okay. Dogs, that animals are always a good hit. Um, I heard. Um, I, I don't know if cooking cozies are still the the hot gem they were, but. Cozies as a whole is is a nice facet, but how do you break your break out of that cozy? You know, how, how, what what can you do to change the cozy? Anybody writing a cozy? Oh, you're all yeah. bloodthirsty noir killers. I see. Okay, no. Okay, cozy in which the, uh, the protagonist is also a licensed locksmith. Oh, see, that's pretty good. That's a nice skill. That's a nice skill. That's a nice skill. Yeah. I mean, my detective superpowers, he can piss people off by talking, but he's so sarcastic. The whole idea behind that, my, my detective was he was, um, if you ever get in an argument with somebody and you think of what you should have said two days later, I think get, put him in that situation. And then two days later, I give him the right words to say at the right time. That's my superpower. So far, so good. But I think a locksmith is, ex, is excellent. Excellent. I mean, but e even some of the old ones, um, the, like a cop, right? Um, cops sheriffs you know they they're they've been done but even those characters you can do something with right longmire managed to survive you know because he's he's that he's he's a, he's a throwback cowboy in modern times in in the um even though i don't like what they did to the series i think longmire is a pretty pretty good detective but you can also have um detectives um what's that so again, Raylan Gibbons pops to mind. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, so who's um, who's writing police procedurals? Uh, I am. I am <laughs> Margaret. I'm well, writing. Wait a minute, Margaret. I thought you had a vet. I it, I have a canine cop and a vet who solve crimes together. Okay, that's that's. That's kind of a slam dunk, if you ask me. That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> no, nobody has nobody has a hard boiled cop who's two days away from retirement. Nobody has one of those. Pick the wrong day to quit sniffing glue. That kind of guy. No. Okay. Right. Um, see, there was a, um, and the thing is, is well, I I'm still just in awe that this genre continues. As, 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 as energetic and lively as it's ever been. Um, I, I'm a sucker for English stuff, right? So I'm watching uh, Treason, if you haven't seen that on Netflix, right? He's MI6 and somebody's set him up and somebody else has done this. And it's like, bullshit, but it's fun. <laughs> anyway, that's just it. But, um, but honestly, having more of these things, you have a better chance of being noticed. You honestly do. Um, and that that's just, just the best advice I, I, I can think of is just I want to write a love story. You gotta write a really unparalleled love story or get lucky, but you can but you can get luckier if there's more 
Velcro hooks on your story than just a love story. A love story that takes place in a submarine that's been on the bottom of Lake Superior for 80 years and we're the fifth generation. That's got something to it, you know? You can use that, that's fine, it's fine. That one's yours. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? You've gotta have something, which is sad because, um, you know, but honestly, all the stories that really matter, uh, we've kind of had that. And sometimes, you know, I, so I've read stories that the only thing they, I mean, you wonder how this got through the slush pile, right? Then you find out, oh, look, the author's name is Kardashian. I wonder what that facet was. You know, that's who we're up against, right? So maybe not Kardashian. I don't think they can write. But if they could, right, they might get I don't around. Think they go through the slush pile either. Yeah, they didn't, yeah, that's true. But I, don't, I mean, I mean, I, I read Virginia Woolf, right? Anybody read Virginia Woolf? Anyway, um, terrible swimming coach, but a great writer. And she had, um, God, a dyke. Mute me. Uh, don't let me say that. That's terrible. Um, but no, I'm reading Orlando and I'm wondering how did this ever get published, right? So the facets are, it was me. she had the right groups, you know? I don't know. Jack Kerouac, you know, just got to get lucky, I guess. You know. Okay. Well, um, anyway, so uh, I guess that's it. Any of the questions, comments? Where's my pie? I don't know how to end this. What do we do? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack.